Before we get into this, I'd just like to say that the previous videos in this series will provide a bit of context to this one, so check them out if you haven't already. On its own, this video will still make sense, so if you don't want to, then that's fine as well. Anyway, on with the show. Okay, now it's time for the big one. How did Gran Turismo 7 end up the way that it did? If we were to boil it down to the most simplified explanation, the root cause that dictates almost every poor decision made with the game, then this is it. Gran Turismo 7 was not designed with fun as a priority. Some of you may already know that and think that it's obvious, and others may be confused as to why I think that a game which aims to simulate driving is not designed to be fun, despite the act of driving, to many of us, being one of the most enjoyable things out there. I want you to take this idea of GT7 not being made with the aspect of enjoyment in mind and just hold on to that as we talk about the game further. One of the key themes that I've taken away from GT7 is sacrifice. What do I mean by that? Well, a common idea for people who played the older GT games was that wouldn't it be awesome if we could have a game like this but with super realistic graphics and handling, but what was never talked about was what would need to be sacrificed to make that a reality. One obvious thing is of course the time needed to produce it, most obviously with the car models. I've mentioned this before, how the time needed to make each car increases, and as such the car list becomes dated much quicker and overall doesn't feel quite as connected to the car culture and motorsport of today, whereas in the older games, where cars could be pumped out at a much faster rate, including cars of that time, those games felt a lot more attached to the zeitgeist of what was really new and interesting back then. If you look at the tracks, there are more sacrifices, not only relating to the sheer number and relevance due to how long it takes to make them, but also in what form they take. The fact that beyond the real world circuits, a lot of the new originals have a fairly similar template of being fast and open with plenty of hard braking zones, and many of the returning originals have been modified to bring them more in line with this ethos as well. This was done mostly to better suit them for online racing and sport mode in particular. I made a more in-depth review of the whole situation as a separate video, so take a look if that sounds interesting. A few people also raised my attention to an interview with series producer Kazunori Yamauchi in which he explains why there is such a lack of proper street circuits in GT7, which relates to how much time, effort and resources needs to be put in to make them. Due to the sheer amount of detail required to make a street circuit in a built-up area to today's standards, Kazunori equates it to making five permanent circuits. So Currently, it simply isn't worth doing. Very sad considering the importance and history that circuits like these have had in the series in the past, and yet another sacrifice made to the mores of increasing visual fidelity and immersion. But beyond purely just the visual stuff, there are more losses for the sake of realism. Another that I've covered is car collecting. How many classics and cars that are rare in real life have their prices jacked up to insane amounts and then shoved in a legendary dealership only for you to save up the cash? purchase them and realise they're almost entirely useless in the game. It mirrors reality, yes, but from a game design standpoint, it's absolute dog shit. And what's truly incredible is how they recognised this issue in the older games, and as such handled these types of cars in a way that felt more natural and rewarding. Car collecting, I feel, is a really core idea of Gran Turismo, hence why my first video in this series was about that. The idea I really wanted to convey, and may not have done fully, come on it was my first proper video after all, was that collecting cars in and of itself doesn't have any inherent meaning, but the context in which you earn them, and the ways in which you can then use them, add that meaning. Of course, some people will enjoy collecting collecting cars for the sake of collecting and no other reason, and that's totally fine, but the issue comes in where the game is then designed around that specific way of playing. Car collecting in GT7 is completely shallow because there's very little context to the act of collecting and then enjoying what you've collected, the cars. You don't need to be a game designer to understand this, but it can help to explain it. <laughs> その後方便を収集する遊びというのが楽しくもめんどくさく感じることもありまして、例えば素材や報酬を集める楽しみがいつまでもいつまでも厚み how Polyphony doesn't seem to grasp this, I'm not sure I'll ever understand. Also, having permanent modifications is a bit weird and I'm not really sure how to feel about it. On one hand, it is again realistic and means that you need to think more about what you choose to upgrade, but on the other hand, it makes the game more restrictive and you can end up with bias remorse, like when you put a wide body on De Tomaso Mangusta because you thought that was a good idea, somehow. It means that I often end up having multiple versions of my favourite cars, which just seems wasteful. You have to look at each of these sacrifices 
sacrifices and ask yourself, is this really worth it? Clearly, Polyphony seems to think so, but I don't believe that it's as black and white as they make it out to be. But of course, realism doesn't explain all of the issues here. In fact, in some cases, an injection of realism would really help. Putting GT Sophie to one side, as it's just a gimmick for now, the normal AI is terrible, mostly, and the unrealistic racing scenarios that the game puts them in really doesn't help. And neither does drastically altering their pace depending on their position relative to the player. Roulette tickets, they're just like real life, where you have the chance to win a whole engine or rare part that can't be attained anywhere else, but you actually just end up with someone's pocket change instead. I don't think you can make a better advertisement to discourage gambling if you tried. As you go through the game, you have these real-life GT World Series drivers as your opponents, and they'll often have things to say in the various events. Most of the time it's pretty standard and forgettable, bar the odd meme-worthy line. Seriously, this one has some real short to comfy and easy to wear energy. The point is, you can pretty much ignore them entirely and not much would change, other than the final cutscene making even less sense. The reason I bring them up though is because GT7 can't seem to keep their narrative consistent. In one place, they're these pro drivers the game wants you to look up to and learn from, and in another, they're fellow aspiring racers trying to make a name for themselves in the world of GT. They can't commit to either story, so they just do both. Let me know if anyone else noticed this as well. Ah, the menu books. They railroad you through a mediocre time and then conclude way too early. Does that sound familiar to you? It really is a masterclass in how not to do something. If you want to express how fascinating and rich the world of cars is, why don't you show us? Show don't tell. It's one of the cardinal rules when trying to express something through media, but GT7 fails at this spectacularly. I know what you're thinking. I haven't complained about the menu books enough. Well, I've actually found a new angle to look at it. Some of you might know that I'm playing through Gran Turismo 3 currently, my beloved, and one thing that I really appreciate about it, and the other previous GT games, is how fluid it feels. If you want to, you can just go from one race to the next, to the next, to the next continuously with no interruptions, just that constant gameplay loop. Whereas in GT7, because of the menu books, that momentum is just brought to a screeching halt every time you go to the cafe. In some of the early menu books, you might spend more time navigating out of a race, over to the cafe, collecting your reward, watching the cinematic and being lectured, and then starting the next menu book than you actually spend in the race itself. How did they approve this? It's so aggressively terrible and nobody questioned it. If you ask me, you can almost directly trace the quality of a Gran Turismo game against the richness and importance of the single player experience in said game. The main reason for this is that I believe a good single player adds meaning to other features in the game. Since probably GT5, the single player aspect in these games has gradually gotten less important over time, with more focus shifted onto things like photo mode, customization, showcasing and learning about cars, and of course, online racing. With the exception of the online stuff, each of these aspects can gain a stronger importance if the core single player experience is itself stronger. Most players will have a much bigger urge to check out scapes or design a livery for a car that actually feels like it's theirs based on the experience they've had with it in the main GT mode. If you're just getting cars thrown at you constantly, there's no reason to develop any sort of attachment towards it, especially when it will be made redundant after a few races. Even more so if it's a really expensive car that you've bought and then find out there's hardly anything to do with it. Why would you care? At that point, it might be more out of obligation, since the game clearly doesn't intend for you to race them, so you might as well do something with it. The issue is that rather than these features feeling like an addition to the single player, they instead dilute it, because it appears that Polyphony believes they can get away with putting in far less effort because there are so many other things to do. This idea is further reinforced with how the game was marketed. Find your line was the tagline, essentially meaning find the aspect of GT7 that really appeals to you, or even find something you already love within GT7. For example, if you already love photography, here escapes, that sort of thing. The true irony though is that for people who loved the classic GT games with their lengthy and rewarding campaigns, well, you're shit out of luck. Guys, we can't find our line if you don't actually put it in the game. It's clear that GT7 is not a game that'll appeal to the hardcore GT fans, much in the same way GT Sport didn't. But how this gets messy is that's not how they advertised it. In the announcement trailer, the first time we ever saw the game, they threw it up in bold letters, Gran Turismo is back. Let's be clear, Gran Turismo hadn't gone anywhere. In June of 2020, GT Sport was still receiving semi-regular updates. So the message was clear, Gran Turismo as we knew it was back. That alone is pretty funny, or pretty depressing depending on your perspective, considering what they did with GT7. But it gets worse. Much 
much worse. Gran Turismo 7 will represent the pinnacle of the GT journey. We think of it as our most complete GT to date. Our aim was to create a driving simulator that all players can enjoy. Whether you're a hardcore Gran Turismo fan or brand new to the series, I think Gran Turismo 7 will be enjoyable for everyone. This is ultimately the classic GT campaign mode, but GT7 has more to offer. Honestly, watching these trailers again, knowing what we know now, it's quite surreal. Whether they're straight up lying to our face, or trying to skirt around the more controversial items in the game, like the roulette tickets, and associated engine swaps, brand invitations, etc. One of my favourite things is in the State of Play, where they show the custom race feature being used to make a multi-class race with LMP1 and GTE cars. If you've actually tried this in GT7, you'll know why this is so funny, because if you choose to be in the faster cars, so LMP1 in this case, your opponents are incredibly bad at overtaking the slower cars, sometimes getting stuck behind them for minutes. And if you choose to be in the slower class, you'll encounter the speed manipulation issue which I covered before, meaning that your supposed opponents will crawl around the track, and you might even catch up with the faster cars, but more likely you'll just end up between the two in the middle of nowhere. The fact that they hardly mention the main single player experience outside of the menu books should have been a bad sign. Now, I'm not coming in here as Mr. Hindsight saying that we should have known what would happen from just these trailers because I really didn't expect them to mess it up so badly either. The main point is that they had all the pieces to make GT7 incredible, they just needed to put it all together. Even the menu books, despite how much I despised them, could have fit into this. All they needed to do was take the classic, classic GT, GT campaign, campaign mode. mode and add the menu books to it, not restructure the campaign entirely so the menu books are the only way to progress. What I imagine is the campaign from say GT4 with all the same events unlocking in the same way but with the menu menu books on the side as an optional activity. If you were a new player to the series, you might be enticed to follow the menu books as they would give guidance and help you through the game, but if you were more experienced, you could just ignore it and do what you want, earning cars in a more natural way. Even still, you might want to check in and claim some rewards for cars you've earned, but the distinction is that you would have gotten those cars anyway, rather than being forced to do it then and there to progress. Also, a better system would be to give you the option of multiple menus to choose from at a given stage, or doing multiple menus at the same time to keep things from getting stale. The thing is that from these trailers, the obvious conclusion would be what I just described, a blend of new and old appealing to both sides of the spectrum and anywhere in between. It really is that simple. So why they butcher the formula to make the menu books the one and only priority is just an unnecessary limitation. But the truly bizarre thing is that in interviews with Kazunori, he talks about GT7 as if this is what they did, a true mixture of new and old that appeals to everyone. If you play GT7, and of course the older titles that it supposedly pulls from, you know that this is far from the truth. So how can he be so barefaced in saying this? Is it deception or simply delusion? Well, to me, I feel that when he says this, he personally believes he is telling the truth. But he designed those older games, how could he not understand the core appeal? Well, my theory has been that he never actually went back and played them since he finished their development and has just been making assumptions. And for a while, that did just stay as a theory since there was no way of confirming it. Until recently, when I came across an interview around the launch of GT7 that shed some light on the situation. When asked about the older games inspiring GT7, he states, Our developers know all the Gran Turismo games and have played them. I prefer to look to the future myself. So whilst it doesn't outright confirm it, that does imply that he didn't go back to play and fully understand them himself. I understand that Kaz is very forward thinking, but if you're making a game that pulls inspiration from its predecessors, do you not think it would be wise to go back and check this for yourself? Some might say it would be negligent not to. If this really is true, it would explain a lot of why GT7 ended up the way that it did. I would liken it to Chinese Whispers, where other people on the dev team may tell Kaz about certain aspects of those older games, and he of course will have memories of them as well, but since he doesn't fully understand them anymore, he can't translate it correctly to GT7. This is why it seems to hit all of the same beats, like winning races to earn cars, doing championships, license tests, missions, having all of that, but doesn't put it all together in a way that is cohesive or seems to understand the core ideas. 
and that then becomes very obvious when you actually play it. This of course is not specific to just me. Whilst I'd love to sit here and take credit for everything in these critiques as my own original ideas, I'm clearly not the only person who feels this way. Anyone who played and loved those older games will understand. I did play Gran Turismo 7, and honestly, as someone who's a long-term fan of Gran Turismo 7, playing through the single-player experience, I honestly felt insulted. I don't mean this as in, like, the game said something about me or disrespected my family or anything like that. I mean insulted as a fan of the series, as someone who sat through delay after delay after delay of every single Gran Turismo game, like, ever being pushed back years that I was playing a game that was so blissfully unaware and just didn't care. I honestly got to the point where I couldn't tell if Gran Turismo 7 was making fun of Gran Turismo, like it was a parody of itself, which is a really weird thing to have happen with a video game, to say the least, especially one that clearly tries as hard as Gran Turismo clearly does. Half of Gran Turismo's appeal really is just navigating well-crafted menus, listening to relaxing music while steadily progressing from used Dodge Neons to Pike's Peak Monsters. <sighs> Except that doesn't exist in Gran Turismo 7, because GT Life has been replaced by these infamous cafe books that's effectively just a battle pass. Drip-feeding you minuscule rewards and wheel spins that manage to be even more insulting than what came before. There's no sugarcoating this. The menu book concept is a complete, utter failure in game design. Polyphony have managed to make a 22-hour tutorial, almost completely stripping away player agency and expression. It's a tutorial that concludes not by releasing the player into the game's sandbox, newly uninhibited and free to explore, but by rolling the credits and dumping them back into the game, feeling as if the decisions were made for them before they even purchased it. You can't just half-arse it and then pretend it's anything like those older games. People will notice, and they won't be happy. The best analogy I can give for GT7 is that it tries to wear a pastiche of the older GT games like a Halloween costume, with no deeper understanding of what they actually stood for and offered. I mean, if their idea of calling back to the history of GT is slapping Sunday Cup on a completely unrelated event, or choosing between three starter cars when you're forced to get the other two within the next five minutes, then you've got to wonder why they even bothered. It's almost like they're making fun of you for liking those previous games. Given what happened to Grand Valley as well, we're at a point where there are people actively wishing we don't get back any more original Gran Turismo tracks for fear of what Polyphony is going to do to them. Sure, that is an exaggerated way of thinking, but I kind of get it. Polyphony doesn't understand why people like Gran Turismo. So by pretending it gets us, by doing things like this and failing miserably, it just becomes insulting. On my second playthrough to record footage, when it asked me if I'd ever travelled the world of Gran Turismo before, I said no. Partly because I was interested what it had to say, and partly because if I chose yes, I was concerned that Polyphony would send someone to my house to personally spit in my face. Throughout the series, you will have noticed that I've mainly used Gran Turismo 3 as a point of comparison against GT7. As I've said, GT3 was my first Gran Turismo and my personal favourite, but there is one specific reason why I use it to compare. You see, if I use GT4 to frame all of my issues with GT7, some could say, that's not fair, GT4 has way more cars and tracks, of course it's going to be a much more complete game. You can't make that argument when looking at GT7 against GT3. There is absolutely no excuse for why GT7 should not be as big of a game and as much of an experience as GT3, if not even more so given the inclusion of so many new features since then. This is one of the many reasons why I absolutely adore GT3, it uses its limited content to the fullest. Not a single car or track goes to waste because it simply can't, given how little content there is, at least by modern standards. Does it go over the top on occasion? Sure, I mean 10 laps of the test course in a Toyota Yaris was not a good idea, by any means, but this is still far preferable than GT7, which goes in the complete opposite direction. It's no surprise that challenge runs of these older games have blown up in recent years because they have so much depth and there are so many different ways to play them. In GT7, challenges like these simply won't work. Aside from the try not to fall asleep and or die of boredom challenge, to be fair though, that one is quite hard. 
the sheer amount of content that goes unused or hardly used in the main single player is staggering. I personally feel really bad for those developers who pour their heart and soul for the better part of a year crafting an immaculate 3D model and then the car gets functionally kneecapped by ending up insanely overpriced and having next to no utility so 99.9% .9 of players would have literally no reason to want it or try to get it. It's just embarrassing. Maybe having SUVs in GT7 isn't such a bad idea after all, because much like SUVs, GT7 is an ode to wasteful excess, having something for the sake of just having it, with no deeper meaning or actual functionality, inefficiency at its most egregious, standing in direct contrast to the games that came before it.